Scoundrels, con man, and scallywags. Swindlers, seducers, deceivers, bad boys, and bad girls. These are the characters that make up the stories featured in Rogues, a big summer 2014 fantasy anthology, or actually I should say, cross-genre anthology, edited by the venerable team of George R. R. Martin and Gardner Dozois. Hello everybody, TMW here once again. Thank you for joining me on this episode of SFF 180. Rogues is a major anthology coming out in June of 2014 from Bantam Books, and it is following up on some other theme anthologies that George R. R. Martin and Dozois have done before, such as Warriors and Dangerous Women. Those are a couple of recent releases of theirs. The whole idea is they come up with the general theme, the kinds of characters that they want writers to explore, and then they approach writers not only from fantasy or science fiction, but from other genres as well. For example, mysteries, thrillers, even westerns, perhaps. So you get a little bit of everything. In Rogues, the whole idea is that we are going to look at those scoundrels and villains that we all sort of secretly love in our hearts, and maybe in our darker moments, wish we could be. There are a total of 20 stories in Rogues, and so over the course of four episodes, I will be reviewing the entire anthology, five stories at a time. The book opens, appropriately enough, with a story by Lord Grimdark himself, Joe Abercrombie, a writer who doesn't get nearly enough credit for the rich vein of humor that often runs throughout his stories. But in Tough Times All Over, the opening story of Rogues, he lets his sense of humor run rampant. The plot itself is a pretty thin little thing. Really, all that happens is a succession of thieves spend the entire story stealing the same package from one another, all in order, like one to the next to the next to the next. This is more or less all an excuse just to hang a series of increasingly funny character sketches. Some of these are quite hilarious. There are a great number of laugh-out-loud scenes in it. The package itself is a big MacGuffin. This is simply a writer who is extremely good at coming up with people just going through that process, just coming up with who are these folks who inhabit these grimy, back streets, these rain-slicked cobblestones in these fantasy cities that we, we, we can all picture in our mind's eye, but go through the teeming hordes, go person by person, and you realize there are lives here. And Abercrombie is doing just that. He's picking the individuals out, thinking about what their backgrounds are. It's pretty much just a creative exercise for him, but it, it provides really delightful reading and an excellent example of how to do this sort of characterization in a very compressed narrative space. The second tale focuses far less on humor and much more on chills. The author is Gillian Flynn. The story is called What Do You Do? And I myself have never read any of Flynn's work before, but that's probably going to be remedied if this story is like anything else she's written. She's best known as the author of the number one best-selling mystery novel Gone Girl, which is about to come out uh, as a movie directed by David Fincher. In What Do You Do? we meet a young woman who started out life very rough, living on the streets with her mother, from whom she learned to panhandle. Uh, she has now grown up, has become a very, very skilled con artist, has even done a little bit of sex work, and it's through this, I won't go exactly into the machinations of it, because you really ought to read the story for yourself, but she manages to sort of detour into a line of work involving being one of these bogus cold-reading psychics that, you know, worried mothers come to for, you know, advice and from the spirit world, that kind of thing, right? But it's through one of these clients that her life takes a very fateful turn. Approached one day by a wealthy suburbanite housewife, she undertakes a job, ostensibly easing this woman's mind by pretending to cleanse the house of evil ghostly spirits. And for a while, the story does seem like it is going to go along a bit of a supernatural ghost story bent, but then it becomes darker, more twisted, psychological, the story twists suddenly come hard and fast, and they are actually the kinds of twists that help to boost dramatic tension, rather than simply coming across as a cheap gimmick, like a you know, Hollywood movie or something. It is, a, it is a consistently chilling, very strange tale, rather astute in its observations, maybe not 100% believable if you think about it too hard, but still entirely compelling, and if you're not already a Gillian Flynn fan, this will make you one. The third story, The End of the Seven Blessings, is by Matthew Hughes, and it returns us to the realm of high fantasy and humorous high fantasy, which Matthew Hughes is known for. He's a writer whom I like a lot, and I've reviewed his novel, Black Brilliant, on the sfreviews.net website. In this tale, a traveler through the woods happens to witness another traveler being set upon and kidnapped by a ravenous, flesh-eating band of orc-like beings. They speared him off, and this guy goes through the abducted man's belongings. In it, he finds a curious artifact. It purports to be a god trapped inside 
a little carved wooden idol. The god promises him interesting things if he only rescues the kidnapped man. But the way things pan out, as always, are a little bit different. No one is entirely being truthful about who they are and what they can do. This one has more of a happy ending than any of the other stories, and while it's a bit lightweight and fluffy, as a lot of Matthew Hughes' work is, it's a very nice break from sometimes darker and more serious themes. The fourth story, Bent Twig, is a mystery. The author is Joe Lansdale. He's a writer that I know, well, I'm acquainted with personally, because he's a regular fixture at all the Texas conventions. He is a deep East Texas native, um, so that's kind of a, a bit of country that I know quite a bit about. I really like Joe. He is a wonderful raconteur. He's a great uh, person to just sort of hang out with and drink, and, and he will sit there with his beautiful East Texas draw and just talk and tell you stories all the live long day. I really like Joe. I'm not a big fan of his writing, though, or his stories, and uh, unfortunately, this tale, Bent Twig, does not improve my opinion of them. Joe's written a number of stories featuring the characters Hap and Leonard. Uh, they're kind of sort of detectives who live way deep in redneck territory, East Texas, in this story, Hap decides to help his wife's daughter from a former relationship uh, who has become swept up in a world of prostitution and drugs, and so he decides to kind of go rescue her when she goes missing because her pimp has done something with her, and then it all leads to horrible things. And it's just ugly and bad. I'm sorry. Uh, the story is full of attempts at humor, including an extended and very weird scene uh, at... Uh, at this small town talent show, um, where the humor just feels incredibly forced. It's like he is trying to derive wit out of these characters who are supposedly characters that you would think he would have some affinity for because, you know, they're from his patch, right? But uh, while he's not really engaging in redneck stereotypes, he's still just setting a lot of these people up for, you know, the buck tooth ridicule. But not only is that incredibly unpleasant, the tale is just violent. Uh, Hap and Leonard themselves aren't likable characters. You know, again, violent a tale on its own is not necessarily a bad thing, but if it's just increasingly grim and there's no one really to root for or like, then it just becomes a rather numbing and grotesque thing to read. And not only that, the story's just misogynist as hell, and uh, yeah. But the fifth story, Tawny Petticoats, brings things back into a lighter realm. This is by Michael Swanwick. He's a fantastic writer who has come up with an alternate New Orleans that is populated not only by people, you know, uh, giving this whole thing a bit of a Wild Wild West flair, but at the same time there are uh, anthropomorphic animals running about and there are zombies doing all of the hard-slash-slave labor. The story is about a couple of grifters, Darger and Surplus, who decide to employ an attractive young woman in what is more or less a money scam, a counterfeiting scam, where they are targeting three of the most prominent New Orleans citizens. Now, do I need to tell you that she ends up outwitting the both of them in interesting and amusing ways? Well, probably not. I think that you can predict that on your own. But I love the world that he has created. It's wonderfully textured. And in a manner similar to the movie Dirty Rotten Scoundrels, even though certain characters uh, end up victorious, others end up getting their comeuppance, you still get the feeling that everyone has kind of turned out all right in the end. So for at least its first five stories, Rogues is indeed a very rich and, for the most part, rewarding rogues gallery. Now, how will the remaining 15 stories shape up? We will have to see. For now, that's all I've got time for in this episode of SFF 180. There will be three more episodes in which the remainder of the Rogues Anthology will be reviewed, so please keep an eye out for those. But remember, these are reviews. You will not always agree with me, but please like, share, and sub if you enjoyed watching. Subscribing is most important, of course, helps the channel grow. And until I see you next time, my fellow scoundrels, happy reading.